everyone and welcome to live streams at the Northeast Georgia History Center. I am the director of the ADMA Ivester Center for Education here and it is my absolute joy to welcome you to this live stream today and wish you a happy Black History Month. So this month our live streams on Wednesdays will be dedicated uh, to telling the stories of Black Americans, African Americans, and more about their history. History. So today we're going to be looking at black history through the lens of American Girl dolls. So we are going to be going in to um, three characters uh, who all have incredibly fascinating and different stories from several different time periods. We will be talking about Cecile Ray, Addie Walker, and um, the 1964 doll Melody. So it's going to be Super excited. I love American Girl dolls. They are what got me to be working at the History Center today. They are wonderful, fun, educational tools with their stories and their history to really bring history to life for people and to learn more about how we got where we are today. So without further ado, we are going to start talking about uh, Cecile Ray. We will be going in um, chronological order. So the oldest doll that we have today is Cecile Ray. So she's from the 1950s, uh, sorry, <laughs> 1850s, 1850s. She is from 1850s New Orleans. Her story is really set in 1853 to 18, um, it, it's really, it's, it's interesting because usually American Girl dolls, they span a couple of years and they usually do with the fours. Um, so it's like the middle of the decade. But with Cecile Ray, in 1853, uh, New Orleans has a big historical event, the yellow fever epidemic, which we'll be talking about in a bit. So it's really, it's an interesting choice that they chose that, um, that year specifically to be um, Cecile's year. And Cecile also has um, an American girl, she has a friend called Marie Grace, they were released together. So their stories go together. Uh, but we're just going to be talking about Cecile today. So Cecile, she is confident, she is curious, and she loves the limelight. She is a performer, she wants to be an actress. She's well-to-do and is from a very highly regarded family, the Ray family, um, that means king. And she speaks French and she speaks English because in New Orleans at this time, uh, that those were the two very prominent languages. French was actually more prominent and English was just becoming just as prominent during this time as more people were coming and immigrating into the city. Now Cecile, she wants to be a stage actress. She has a talent for telling stories, um, for reciting different types of poetry and different uh, literature. She also volunteers at Holy Trinity Orphanage along with Marie Grace. Um, that's one of the large, uh, one of their uh, stories in their, one of the books in their series is, is dedicated to talking about their work at the orphanage. And she is homeschooled. So a lot of times in the American Girl books, they have uh, one, one book that is dedicated to what was school like during this time period. Uh, Cecile Ray, since they are in the yellow fever epidemic, she has a little bit of a different um, line up for what the stories are exactly look like, but she is homeschooled, um, not just because of the epidemic, but because she is a very wealthy uh, child, um, is from a very prominent family, and that would have been how, at uh, this time period, if you were well-to-do enough, you would have a tutor come into your home and give you private lessons. So. Um, that is how she, she does her schooling. She does go and take voice lessons, though, with um, Madame um, Ocean Rousseau. Uh, so she um, does go and, and take voice lessons, but that is a, of a different type of schooling. So, 1850s New Orleans. What is it, the city like at this time period? So this is a really interesting city. In, America because it had never belonged to England. It was founded by the French in 1718 and was ruled by France or by Spain for a hundred years before becoming a part of the United States. So the United States bought New Orleans as part of the Louisiana Purchase. So 
New Orleans is in Louisiana. It's one of the big port cities that the United States got in the Louisiana Purchase. And it's, it's just, uh, it's a very interesting place. It has a diverse range of citizens. It has a mixture of cultures from Native Americans to people from France, Spain, Africa, and Canada. And then you have people, even more people coming in and more people immigrating from different places. But um, New Orleans for its first hundred years was really um, a combination of those cultures that I just listed and then got even more and more added to the city as time went on. So, <clears throat> um, this uh, city, um, like I said, it never belonged to England. Um, it's very Catholic uh, because it, those were uh, the main religions of people coming from France and from Spain, and that's very different and has um, a little bit of a different flavor than Puritan New England and Anglican England, um, Protestant England people who are coming over, so it's, it's very different from that. New Orleans is also an incredibly important port city, which means that it's right there located at the end of the Mississippi River, right near the Gulf of Mexico. It controls a lot of trade, of uh, goods coming in and out uh, for all of the surrounding regions. So it became a very wealthy city with all of that trade going on. It was also a very important city to have as um, just militarily as well as for trade. So during the 1850s, we see an influx of immigration from Ireland and Germany and other parts of Europe to New Orleans. And now this New Orleans were kind of like, hmm, these people are different. They don't speak French. They have some different ideas. Um, a lot of people from Ireland were also Catholic, but you have Germans who were mainly Protestant coming in as well. So you bring in um, Protestantism and uh, things uh, that, that's just different than what New Orleans had been uh, majority doing as a majority. So New Orleans was also more integrated than other cities in America were at the time, but free people of color were still not treated equally with their white counterparts. But one of the really, really fascinating things about Louisiana is that they had such a large population of free people of color. So uh, the gens de color libre uh, were uh, that's what they were would be called in French and what they were generally referred to in New Orleans because French speaking New Orleans. So in 1853, nearly a quarter of New Orleans population was of African heritage. Now, of course, some were enslaved, but there were also thousands who were free people of color. And now this is this is incredibly interesting and also one of the important reasons we note that New Orleans was never a never owned by England because the governments of France and Spain, which New Orleans had been under for a hundred years before it went to America, they had allowed enslaved people to be able to earn money to buy their own freedom. And that's why we have such a large population of free people of color who were able to free themselves from their enslavement by working extra to free themselves. That was allowed under the governments of France and Spain in New Orleans. Now, free people of color um, had more freedom and more opportunity than other black people did in other parts of America, but of course they still faced discrimination. Um, many were business owners, like Cecile's father, Jean-Claude, and he was a stonemason who uh, ran a very successful stone yard. And of course, all of the characters in American Girl doll books are based off of real people um, and real uh, ideas, not necessarily one person, but 
several different people, of course, but there were many people who, uh, just like Cecile's father, Jean-Claude, who were stonemasons, and their work can be seen in the incredible um, graveyards that New Orleans is known for, is all of those graveyards there above ground, because New Orleans is below the waterline, so burying people six feet under, as is standard in most parts of the country, does not work there, so they had created these beautiful stone works for above ground graves. Um, and that's just one example of some of the stone masonry uh, that could be used from the fictional, of course, Cecile's father, who was a stone mason. Of course, many other property owners, like Cecile's mother, um, so, uh, oh sorry, so many also were property owners, like Cecile's mother was in the book, and she is a very successful businesswoman who owns and manages several houses and properties that were left to her by her parents. So free people of color also came from the French colony of <coughs> Saint Dominique, which is now Haiti. So you also have free people of color who are immigrating into New Orleans from Saint Dominique after their revolution. Now, another very interesting thing that is very much uh, related to New Orleans, even to this day, is Mardi Gras and Mardi Gras balls. So Mardi Gras is a French word which means Fat Tuesday. That's what its direct translation. So Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras is the Tuesday that is before Ash Wednesday, which is the Christian holiday. So Mardi Gras is a day of feasting, of merriment, and lots of dancing. And in 1850s, balls were the highlight of the Mardi Gras season. And Cecile absolutely loves these balls. She loves to dance. And that's one of her dreams is to be an actress on the stage and then attend balls and dance with people all night long. That is what she dreams of doing when she grows up. So she absolutely adores these balls, and in one of the books, she indeed goes to a Mardi Gras ball. So children's balls, because Cecile at this time is a child, in the American Girl doll books, the characters are usually nine years old and then they turn 10. So these children's balls, they took place early in the evening, but usually they would take place in the same ballrooms that would later host the balls for the adults. So. Now, which was, this is another interesting part of the books because Cecile does have this friend, Marie Grace, who is white. There were separate balls for people of color and for white people. Even though a lot of times they were held in the same building, it would just be in different ballrooms, so they were segregated. So Cecile and Marie Grace, they go to this ball together, but they can't dance in the same rooms, even though they're, they're dressed the exact same, it's just because of the color of their skin, they are indeed segregated. So while Cecile is incredibly wealthy and um, has a lot going for her, she still does face discrimination and segregation. Now, as I was saying, um, Cecile, I believe we just saw um, a picture of Cecile's ball gown dress. Masks and costumes would be worn to these balls. So Cecile, she wore a mask and a beautiful dress, which she was a stage costume, um, and it was a fairy, fairy-inspired dress from one of the opera that had been put on by her voice teacher called The Magic Flute. So there she is dressed as a fairy with her Mardi Gras, um, beautiful Mardi Gras ball gown and, of course, her mask. Now, a very sad, very um, influential historic event that happened in New Orleans in 1853, the year where Cecile's story is set, is the yellow fever epidemic. And yellow fever struck New Orleans in the summer of 1853, where about 30,000 fell ill and 10,000 people died. We know today that the yellow fever was spread through mosquito bites, of infected people 
and to uninfected people. They did not know that at this time. Germ theory is still in its, its infancy. People really don't understand about germs or about how bugs can spread things either. So when the yellow fever appeared in 1853, most people weren't worried. Uh, New Orleans had not had a bad outbreak of yellow fever in several years. They get yellow fever almost every summer. It was just a common occurrence. It, it just, it happens. There would be so soldiers and sailors who come in, because it's a port city. You have people coming in and out all the time. And usually it would be um, kept off to the docks. The sick people would stay on their ship until they got better and then uh, the rest of the city didn't really have to worry about it. And then also New Orleans natives like Cecile and her family, well, they believe themselves to be very unlikely to get yellow fever because more likely than not, a lot of the people who had lived in New Orleans their entire life had probably been exposed to it at some point or another just living there or their parents lived there and uh, they built up natural immunity to it if, or else they were exposed as this child, they didn't have a bad case and now they have natural immunity to it. So there's a very valid reason why the New Orleans natives believe themselves to be very unlikely to get yellow fever. Very scientific reasons, just besides them being like, oh, well, it doesn't affect me. It really is because it probably did not affect them as badly as it affected those who immigrated there who did not have any natural immunity to it. And of course, people who were from New Orleans, they really considered themselves to be New Orleans, uh, New Orleanian, they didn't necessarily consider themselves to be American. At this point, New Orleans has been its own city longer than America has been a country. So people have far more loyalty to New Orleans, the city, than to America, the country. Which is just a little interesting fact. So, why is 1853 so bad for yellow fever? Well, weeks of rain had created ideas ideal conditions for mosquitoes to breed and to spread the yellow fever. In 1853, it seems to have also been a deadlier strain than usual. And in the story, Cecile's brother Armand actually is infected and Cecile has to nurse him back to health and to help, care her, uh, to help her family care for him. Now, Cecile's family, they stayed. But many families did flee the city, just trying to get away from the sickness and the death. And of course, business and social life came to a complete stop as the city was dealing with this epidemic. Hospitals and orphanages overflowed that summer. The mayor had cannons fired every morning to frighten off the yellow fever, and also barrels of tar burned on the streets hoping that the smoke would drive away the disease. So, uh, while I don't think that the cannons probably helped all that much, I do think that barrels of tar on the street corner creating such thick smoke, um, of course, they thought that a lot of times in this, this era, people thought it was bad air that you were breathing in that would make you sick, so that's why people would go to the mountains or the seasides to get fresh air because they thought it was the air, the tainted air that was making you sick. So they were trying with the barrels of tar to get, to drive out the bad air with all of this smoke, which also is, I mean, we know that today to be bad air, but they were trying to drive the bad air away. Of course, also an unintended consequence of this is if you have barrels of tar burning on the street and thick smoke everywhere, people are probably not going to go outside their homes or to go out places and have to go through all that thick smoke so it kept people away from each other and from congregating. Now, after that awful summer, by October, schools and shops did begin to reopen again and more ships began to return to New Orleans and the city began to recover from the epidemic. The, the weather got cooler, the mosquitoes, they don't like to breed. Um, and they're not as active in the colder weather, and therefore New Orleans was able to return. Uh, but of course, um, it, it basically, no one, everyone was very scared about going to New Orleans still, um, because they were referring to New Orleans at that point like the city of the, 
the dead really is because that one summer it was horrific the amount of uh, people that had died but also just the percentage of the of New Orleans because New Orleans today it's a really big city and it was a really really big city back then today but the population numbers are still not um, there when we think of a big city today um, it's a big city back then would still be be smaller just because of of the way people um, were working and congregating there so um, New Orleans was actually one of the second largest, I think it's the second largest city at this time, right behind New York City. So um, give you an idea of just how many people were there, but and also just how devastated they were by this epidemic. All right, so that wraps up um, some of the really big historical events that we get to see through Cecile's life. And now we're going to move on to Addie Walker. So Addie Walker's story takes place in 1864. That's during the middle of the American Civil War. Now, Addie Walker, her full name is um, <coughs> Aduke, and she is named after her great-grandmother on her father's side. And it means much loved in Yoruba, which is a Nigerian language. And Addie is described as being brave, as being loving, as being thoughtful and kind. And she is very close-knit with her family, and she is absolutely devastated when they are separated. Right in the first few chapters of her story, um, Addie's father and her brother Sam are sold off of the plantation where they were enslaved due to the plantation struggling financially because of the Civil War. Now, their family had already been talking about um, escaping and running away um, via the Underground Railroad, and they're absolutely devastated because they, they get torn apart before they're able to do this. Um, and Addie, who is so close with her family, takes this really hard. And to express this sadness, she enjoys riddles. Um, so she uses something that she enjoys in a way to, to express herself, to express her sadness at the separation of her family. And she uses the riddle saying, what's heavy as a pail of water but still empty? And the answer is her heart. So... At this time, slavery is still an institution in American society. It is about to be repealed after the American Civil War with the 13th Amendment, um, and also the Emancipation Proclamation is already in effect, in effect. Addie is technically free at this point. Um, but of course, the Confederate States of America does not recognize the Emancipation Proclamation, does not enforce the Emancipation Proclamation, um, but Addie is technically free, which is, it's, the Emancipation Proclamation um, is an interesting piece of American uh, uh, legislature, but, um, and, and this is one of those things, is that it freed those enslaved but did it actually free them? In this case, um, Addie is indeed still a slave. She does not get to fully realize the Emancipation Proclamation until she frees herself. So Addie does not think that it is right or fair that white people own and abuse black people in the institution of slavery. She was born enslaved on a North Carolina tobacco plantation. And she was born into the system of chattel slavery. So there are different types of slavery. The one that is used um, in America is called chattel slavery, and that is the enslaving and owning of human beings and their offspring as property, able to be bought, sold, and forced to work without wages. So Addie escapes on the Underground Railroad with her mom. So the family had been planning to run away together before her brother and uh, before her father and brother were sold, but she and her mom continue with this plan. Of course, to go on this 
Underground Railroad, they have to leave behind Uncle Solomon and Aunt Lula, and also Addie's baby sister, Esther. So, of course, Addie wants Uncle Solomon and Aunt Lula to come with them on the Underground Railroad. It was really Uncle Solomon's idea, and he knows where the house is, but Addie's mom says that um, her, the aunt and uncle are indeed too old. They can't run um, and be able to endure. And Addie's baby sister, Esther, she also won't be coming with them. And Addie insists that they can't leave Esther, but her mom says um, that she has to stay behind because originally they were planning on taking Esther because the whole family was to go and there would be Sam and Addie, Addie's brother Sam and her father and her mother who could all help carry Esther, but Addie's mother herself um, just can't, can't carry Esther. And also she's really scared that Esther, who's a this baby, would be able, she, they aren't able to, you know, babies aren't able to control their emotions. They cry if they're hungry or sleepy or wet and the crying might give them away to those who are pursuing them or slave catchers. So now what is the Underground Railroad? It's not an actual train that travels underground. It is actually a network of secret routes and safe houses that are established in the United States during the early to mid 19th century and used by enslaved African Americans to escape into Northern free states and into Canada. So, the Underground Railroad is assisted by abolitionists and others who are sympathetic to the cause of those who are escaping slavery. So, there, there's a whole lot going on in Addie's story. Um, as you can just tell, we are, this is just a few chapters into Addie's story, really, and there's already so much going on. Um, one of the big things about Addie's story is that it takes place during the American Civil War. So the American Civil War, of course, is a civil war in the United States that was fraught from 1861 to 1865. So when Addie's story takes place, they're already about three to four years in, depending on what month, into the American Civil War. It's almost done. Of course, they don't know that. Um, they, they understand that the people there understand that it, it'll probably end soon uh, because how much longer can this go on for? But they don't know that with any type of certainty that we do looking back from the present. So uh, the American Civil War was fought between northern states that were loyal to the Union and southern states that had seceded to form the Confederate States of America. Uh, this is, that's the briefest overview I think anyone could ever give to the American Civil War uh, because there are much, uh, much complexities that go into the American Civil War. But this is Addie's story, so we're going to focus on Addie. So, um, of course, um, American slavery takes a large role in the formation of the Confederate States of America and in the fighting of the American Civil War. Once that Emancipation Proclamation happens, uh, the Union soldiers are not just fighting for the North and South to remain together, for the Union to stay together. They are also fighting to free those enslaved and to end the institution of slavery. So Addie's brother, Sam, they are reunited and uh, later in the stories, and Addie's brother Sam had ended up fighting for the Union Army, and he has been wanting to do that for a very long time. Uh, he and Addie's father, they escape from the plantation that they are sold to, and when they make it, Sam goes and he enlists and fights in the Union Army because that Emancipation Proclamation, one of the other things that it did was also allow for African Americans to join the Union Army. And Sam is one of those people. And he actually um, ends up losing his arm um, and becomes an amputee fighting for the Union and fighting for the cause of freedom. So, once Addie gets to freedom, they 
make it to Philadelphia on the Underground Railroad, um, riding un under um, in the backs of wagons under hay, getting onto a ship for the first time in her life. They make it to Philadelphia, and Addie has all of these dreams and hopes of what life is going to be like in freedom, and what she finds is a lot of that, a lot of her hopes and dreams are, are there, but it's not quite like she imagined it. There is still segregation. So racial segregation is the systematic separation of people into, um, of people into their racial or other ethnic groups in daily life. And Addie thinks that this is grossly unfair and that whites and blacks um, should be together um, that they should not have to keep separate lives and um, she thinks that they should be able to live together. So this life in freedom is not exactly everything she imagined it to be, but it is a lot of good things as well. Because in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Addie gets to attend school. And Addie, she is very intelligent and she is good at school and she learns to read and write with just, just within a few months of ever being in a schoolroom, of ever having someone wanting to, um, to be, be a teacher and to be there. Of course, her family is going to teach her as much as they know within the confines of, of their family unit, but um, it was really forbidden for enslaved people to be able to learn to read or to write. So this is an incredible act of her um, gaining these incredible skills that had been denied her for so long. And Addie, she actually um, shows interest throughout the series of being a teacher when she gets older to pass on that knowledge that she has gained to other people. So Addie's mom, she finds work in Mrs. Ford's dress shop. While they had been enslaved, Addie's mother had been a seamstress um, for her enslaver, and now she gets to work in a dress shop where she is paid for those services. And Addie, she likes to help her mom and to help Mrs. Ford um, in the dress shop. But Addie is also sometimes very upset and rather sometimes ashamed of her poverty status. While her mother does make money, it is not much. And Addie had imagined this life of luxury that they, that they would have once they got to freedom and um, uh, she, that that dream is not necessarily realized right there at first because um, that she, her mother does not get paid all that much to, so. And Addie, she compares herself to a girl in her class named Harriet. And Harriet is incredibly wealthy and has nice pretty clothes and um, basically had the kind of life that Addie expected to find in freedom, um, but has not been realized yet. So, the Emancipation Proclamation. I have been referencing this in the past several slides, so now we're going to dive into what exactly is the Emancipation Proclamation. So, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued by, uh, by United States President Abraham Lincoln in 1862, but then it was ratified in uh, January 1st, 1863. And it said that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are henceforth and shall be free. So Addie reads this proclamation in her new church. She uses her newfound skill of, uh, or new learned skill of reading, and she reads this proclamation in her church to celebrate, I believe it is the one year anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation going into effect, which did indeed free her. Um, but of course, the complexities is, uh, of that is that she had to still go on the Underground Railroad and achieve her own to, uh, uh, freedom to really indeed be free at this time. Now, another thing that is 
becoming a big deal at this time, and it's also one of Addie's favorite treats is ice cream. So ice cream's origins are known to reach far back as the second century BC, but it wasn't until the 1800s, um, and basically until the 1800s, ice cream remained a rare and exotic dessert enjoyed mostly by the elite. But wide availability of ice cream in the late 19th century led to the creation of the ice cream sundae and it became far more available to everyone and it is one of Addie's absolute favorite treats. Once she is reunited with her brother Sam, he actually works in an ice an ice wagon where he delivers ice to keep the ice cream cold. Uh, of course, other things too, but one of the things is ice cream. Uh, so Addie is an incredibly strong um, character and she um, builds this new life for herself and her family and freedom. She uses what she has learned for reading and writing. She writes letters. Um, trying to reunite her family to see if anyone had heard about them and um, she does get to be reunited with her father and her brother and her little sister and Aunt Lula but Uncle Solomon had sadly passed away before they were able to be reunited. So that's just a small glimpse into some of the incredible historic events that shaped Addie's life and were uh, shaping America at that time. And now we're going to jump about a hundred years into the future and we're going to meet Melody Ellison, whose story takes place in 1964. So this is a hundred years after Addie's story. So Melody enjoys singing and gardening. Those are two of her big passions. And she feels very calm and peaceful when she's working in the garden. Now, she does not always feel like she's a leader, even though when sometimes her actions show that she is indeed a natural leader. She also sometimes gets nervous singing in front of a large crowd or performing, even though she does really love singing. Sometimes she gets stage fright. Now, the Ellison family. So, Melody's father, or who she calls daddy, works at the auto factory. And her mother, who she calls Mommy, works as a school teacher. And then she has um, a sister and a brother, both older. So there's Yvonne, and that's Melody's older sister. And she's home a week early from Tuskegee University at the beginning of the books. And then there's also Dwayne, her older brother, and he is a talented vocalist with sights set on becoming a big Motown star. And her parents, they really believe that education in college will be a big boost up to their family, so they really encourage education. Um, and sometimes this uh, puts the parents um, in conflict with the older brother, Dwayne, who really wants to be a music star. Um, because they don't think that music is going to be um, that good of a career path for Dwayne. Now, one of the really big things that shape Melody's life is the civil rights movement, which is going on at this time. So her older sister, Yvonne, she spends a lot of time partaking in political activism and volunteer work. So the civil rights movement was the struggle for social justice that took place mainly during the 1950s and 1960s for black Americans to gain equal rights under the laws of the United States. And we see this in Melody's story where, um, of course, her older sister is involved, um, who goes to school in Tuskegee, Alabama. That's, of course, in the South where racial segregation is far more prevalent and perhaps extreme than it is up North where um, Melody has been raised, but of course it's still going on up there too. Uh, and we see how Melody uses her own voice to really step up and to be an activist in her own way. Now, 
Another thing that we see an example of in Melody's story is the Great Migration North. So Melody's father explains to her um, a story from his own past um, about discrimination against black people in the South that is more severe than it is up north. And he recounts to her about when he was a young man with a peanut farm in Alabama. And when he would go to market to sell his crops, he'd only receive half as much money as the neighboring white farmers. Even if they had the exact same amount and the same quality of the product, and when he pro uh, protested and said that this was unfair treatment, well, the marketeer attempted to intimidate him. And this is one of the things, this um, one of the examples of the type of discrimination that really drove him to move his family to Detroit. And this would be part of what is known as a bigger, the bigger picture history. That's sometimes what we call micro history. So it's one person's account that goes with the macro history, which is like the big overall social movement of the Great Migration North. So the Great Migration, sometimes also known as the Great Northward Migration or the Black Migration, was the movement of six million African Americans out of the rural um, southern United States to the urban Northeast, Midwest, and West that occurred between 1916 and 1970. So Melody and her family are very much a part of that Great Migration. Of course, another huge thing that shapes Melody is Motown. So her brother Dwayne asked her to actually sing backup for him on a record, and that means that Melody gets to go to the Motown music studio and add her voice to a real record. So Melody loves what is called the Motown sound, and the multiple acts coming out of Hitsville, USA, and some of those acts in include the Supremes, Marvin Gaye, Little Stevie Wonder, and Martha and the Vandellas. So, uh, mu music, uh, Motown music is music released or that is reminiscent of the U.S. record label, uh, Tamala Motown. So, the first black-owned record company in the U.S.A., and that is Motown Records. So it was founded in Detroit in 50, uh, sorry, <laughs> it was founded in Detroit in 1959 by Barry Gordy, and it is important for popularizing the soul sound of music and giving voice to a lot of uh, black artists and uh, making them celebrities that we're also going to talk about important social issues, um, bringing awareness to their culture and their struggles. And Melody gets to be a part of that, along with her family. Now, we have just done, of course, a rather brief overview of some of the really big historical topics and the events that shaped these American girls' lives. So now, if you have any questions, you can please type them in the chat and I will do my absolute best to answer them. But in the meantime, if this is your first live stream with us, we are so, so happy and glad that you joined us today. We host these free family-friendly live stream programs every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And we have also have affordable digital memberships that give you access to exclusive member live streams every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, digital memberships, they are as low as $3 a month or $35 a year. And you can visit us at www.negahc.org slash member for more details. Next Wednesday, our live streams will be about the formerly enslaved American patriot, Austin Dabney, who fought during the American Revolution. We will have living history interpreter, <coughs> interpreter Mustafa Slack. He will portray Austin Dabney, 
And our own Glenn Kyle will portray Dad's knee's longtime friend and fellow patriot, Giles Harris. So we hope that you will join us for this absolutely fascinating story next Wednesday, Friday, um, sorry, next Wednesday, February 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Our next member live stream is this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, and that will be about the history of courtship and the traditions of courtship uh, dating, uh, and dating culture in the Victorian era. So I hope you will become a digital member and join us for that. Okay, do we have any questions? All right, hello, this is Libba from Behind the Scenes. Uh, so I'm gonna monitor the chat, so if you have any questions, please go ahead and chat your questions. And thank you, Marie, for that fascinating live stream. Absolutely, I love American Girl dolls. I think that they do such a good job of, um, kind of like I started to say there earlier, making these big, big historical topics um, and see how they really relate to individual people. Um, so they take like large things like um, Motown or the Great Migration North um, being a free person of color or being um, an enslaved person and they make it personal to where you can um, learn about what it was really like not just as an idea but for a person. All right, so let's see. Um, Oh, well, we have some compliments for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Marshan uh, slash the Disney diva uh, says that this is my first time and this was good. Thank you for the spotlight on black history. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, oh, and she's also asking, is there an Addy movie? I think we did see clips from either an Addy movie or perhaps a TV series. Do you know? Okay. So I was doing some research into this because as a child, I was very into American Girl dolls and kept up with everything. And then I grew up and have not kept as close tabs on it. From what I can tell, um, American Girl has done some more like YouTube clips, movies. Um, I don't think for Addie, but they have definitely done so. Wait, how? Which way am I pointing? There we go. Um, for Melody, that Melody has her own movie that I think is on Amazon, and there are also clips of it on the American Girl doll YouTube. Um, I am not aware of an Addy movie, but I think it would be an incredibly fascinating movie um, if they wanted to do that. Yeah, I would. I would love to yeah. see that. So uh, I guess do a little uh, do a little YouTube searching yes. for that. <laughs> um, we also have another question um, in Melody's story. Does she talk about her school experience? She does talk about her school experience um, and going to school. I think that's in the second book. I'll be quite honest. Melody, she's awesome, but she came out after um, I, I grew up. Uh, so I did not actually read any of her books. Um, I, I only know what I, I have done my research on reading summaries of them. And it seems like um, that's the second book of hers where she um, plants a garden at her school and she really tries to head up that project. And she has to face, of course, there are classmates who are not like her, um, who, who are white and she, the school, I believe, is integrated, but of course there are still tensions there, and she still has she still faces discrimination sometimes, and um, she tries to lead this school effort to plant a garden, but of course faces uh, difficulties, um, including discrimination. All right. Well, it seems like um, we don't have any other questions, just some compliments for you. So oh, thank, you. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. And a big thank you to those who were able to donate today. Yes, thank you. Um, of course, you know, we've been relying on digital programs yes. and we're so <laughs> happy to bring you these programs uh, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. But we do want to mm -hmm. try to make our donation goals since we are as a small nonprofit museum, we are doing the best <laughs> during yes. the pandemic um, to uh, to keep everything going afloat. So your <laughs> your dollars, no matter how much, um, really really help. Now let's see. Uh, Nancy asks. Um, we do have one more question. Uh, in Cecile's story, what did they do with the baby? 
now the baby. I'm trying now. I don't know the stories as well as you do, Marie. But um, now I, I do recall that Esther was a baby character yes, in Addie's, in Addie's story. story. Addie, there we are. But Cecile, um, I can't remember what her her family structure was like. So I think what they're talking about is that Marie Grace finds a baby. So Cecile's friend Marie Grace, they find a baby, and that that's abandoned um, for unknown reasons. It's abandoned at Marie Grace's. I'm this is this is a test of my memory, y'all. Um, <laughs> It's abandoned at Marie Grace's father's medical practice, which is also located in their home. And I think what happens is they take the baby to the Holy Trinity Orphanage, and that's one of the reasons why Cecile and Marie Grace go there and volunteer so much is because the baby that they have this attachment to is there. Oh, okay. I think that's what happened. Okay. <laughs> so maybe we can find out more about that story. Now, now, folks, we also have another American Girl Dolls segment. Do we have two or three now? I think this is our third one. I think this is our third one. So yeah. if you go back to our YouTube channel, which if you're watching on YouTube, yes. please give us a subscribe. <laughs> yeah. um, but if you go to our YouTube channel, Maria's done a two more of these mm -hmm. and uh, through different time periods and different cultures. So we do hope that you will um, check out those. If you want to share this live stream, anyone can watch it uh, after the live stream's done. So uh, I, it looks like in the chat, all we've got are lots of thank yous. So uh, thank you so much. We appreciate all of you and we hope to see you next week for our live stream about Austin Dabney. Yes. All right, folks, take care. Thank you, Marie. Right, thank you.